to bring that personality under his control. I, I've used this example uh, several times, and I, I'm trying to look up something right quickly, uh, but I'll get there in a little bit. Uh, John, the apostle of Jesus, sometimes people ask, uh, what Bible character do you uh, relate to most? And most women choose a woman. I always choose John the Apostle. And the reason I do is because I, I just, my, my, I feel that my personality is a whole lot like his. Because you, you may remember Jesus gave James and John a nickname. What was it? Sons of Thunder. Mm -hmm. Why? Oh, they, you know. Uh, did they love Jesus? Oh, yes. They loved Jesus with a passion. What do we remember John by? When we read through the whole New Testament, what do we remember most? First, second, third John. What's his main word that he uses there? Love. Love. Yeah. And some people will say, uh, Jesus turned John from this passionate person into a loving apostle. I, I don't see it that way. I see that John was as passionate about love as he was before about Jesus. But Jesus had taken that passion and molded it so that he could use it. And as I mentioned, my mother told me I was the most stubborn child she had. And I was. Lori's back there saying, me too. <laughs> uh, when I was two, mother wanted me to shut the door, and I didn't want to shut the door. And finally, mother just took me and forced me to shut that door. I still didn't want to shut that door. And I didn't really shut the door. Mother did. But I can just hear God saying, Arbella, be be, be patient with her. I can use that stubbornness. I can use it. If I can turn that stubbornness toward this. And I, that's the way I see John. Very passionate. Does God want uh, followers who are just la da anyway? What did he say about the, the church there in Revelation in Laodicea? You're what? Lukewarm. He said, I don't want lukewarm people. I'll spew you out of my mouth. He wants passionate people, but he wants that passion under his control. And John had to learn that. And guess who else has had to learn that? <laughs> and probably all of us have had to learn that there were some things about our personality that had to be brought under God's control. I, and that's what meekness is all about. Uh, you know, one of the best uh, examples to use for meekness is uh, a thoroughbred horse. That horse is strong and wild, but you break the horse, you train the horse, and then that horse is strong and under the rider's control. And that's how meekness works. Meekness doesn't mean we don't say anything, we don't do anything, we just walk all day long. But it does mean that we strive to have that under control. But Sarah yeah. was also the apostle he chose to take care of his mother. Right, right. And so you know he loved him. Right, and in fact, uh, uh, John in his gospel calls himself the apostle whom Jesus loved. And then when James and John wanted to be where? In the right and left hand of Jesus in his kingdom. We want the best places, places of power. And Jesus asked them, are you able to 
uh, supper, you know. The, oh, yeah, yeah, we all. What happened to James? He was beheaded by Herod early on in the book of Acts. So here is John. See, James and John were almost always mentioned together. Here's John who loses his brother right there for the cause of Christ. But he keeps on going. And in the end, John is as passionate about us loving one another as he was early on about Jesus. It's just that Jesus turned his passion in the right direction and put it under his control. And that's why I relate to John more than anybody else. Uh, because there are a lot of things about me that needed to be brought under his control. But that stubbornness and that passion that I had, almost anything I wanted to do, my dad taught me any job that's worth doing is worth, worth doing right and worth doing well. And almost anything I started out to do, I I wanted to be the best, and not just the best I could do, but a lot of times, like I said in that math classroom, I wanted to be better than everybody else. And most of the time, I was But that's not good here. Lori. A math teacher taught me one of the most valuable lessons. What was it for math? She taught me a valuable lesson. You don't have time to do it right. You have time to do it over. Yeah. And over and over and over. I don't know what you get it right. And you know, aren't you glad that God lets us do it over and over and over? It gives us a second chance and a second chance and a second chance, even when we mess up. And so we're not we're not perfect. And a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today, examples from my life and maybe from people that I've known, just illustrates the fact that we're not perfect. And uh, John says this here somewhere, yeah, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we acknowledge those sins, and most of the time that's in the privacy of your own home in your mind and in your heart if we confess those sins he is faithful and just to forgive us and verse 7 he says if we walk in the light as jesus is in the light we have fellowship with one another in the blood of jesus his son cleanses us from all sin so as we walk we sometimes stumble but when we stumble, we don't just fall out of the light. We stumble in the light. And if we get up and confess that sin and ask God to help us, we're still in the light. And the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us. Now, we can stumble and stay down and kind of roll out of the light, can't we? Or we can step over. Uh, but I just wanted to bring out the fact that, that we're not perfect. And that there are times when people do weird things. But let's uh, look at chapter 3 and get into our discussion right now. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. And let's just stop right there, uh, because uh, the first thing uh, that uh, George Carmen talks about, and the first thing that I want to talk about, and the first thing here that James talks about, is right here, be not many uh, among you teachers. In the Old King James Version, it says that there be not many among you uh, masters. But that was a shortened form of schoolmaster, which was in 1611 what teachers were called, schoolmasters and not necessarily teachers. But as the English language changed, then uh, updating the, uh, 
the translations uh, to be not many of you teachers. And you might think, wait a minute, don't we need some more teachers? Yeah, we do. So why is James discouraging that? Uh, you know, uh, and sometimes, sometimes we do this. Uh, I've gone to teacher workshops and been in classes where uh, I've heard the, the teacher say, well, you know, anyone out there who wants to can teach. And I say, I'm like, wait a minute. Not necessarily. Uh, you know, and, and I think we, we, uh, we're so in need of teachers, you might say, in the church, that we try to make it seem like anyone can teach. I've also sat in classes where the person teaching shouldn't, shouldn't have been teaching, didn't know enough, hadn't studied enough, what? Yeah, and sometimes they don't care enough. And what will we do? What will we do in public schools or in private schools or in the universities? If we knew a teacher didn't know its subject, would we want our child in that class? Uh, and sometimes in smaller schools out here, especially in mathematics, we have that problem because there are not very many qualified math teachers and most of them are in the larger districts getting better pay and so on. And you get out here in these smaller, and that's why I love Kenneth and, why can't I think of her name right now? Jones, Kenneth and Dorothy. No, no, I'm not, it's a couple in East Texas. It's Northeast Texas. Uh, that um, uh, in the Honey Grove area. They're both retired math teachers, but they go to a little, uh, they drive every day across the county to a little uh, country school and help the math students there because there's nobody, there's nobody qualified to teach them. And so they go and uh, they just had twin grandchildren. So I think she decided that this year was going to be her last year. But usually we don't have uh, you know, really qualified people out in these smaller schools. And so it makes a problem when they come to TCC. We have to remediate. Uh, but this happens a lot of times out here, and we're not happy with it out there, so why would we be okay with it in the church? I'd rather see us have one big class with a competent, well-prepared teacher than three or four little bitty classes without competent teachers. Lori. Yeah. <coughs> all the cases and times were slow learners such mm -hmm. as myself. Experience mm -hmm. and life skills. Yeah, right. right. As all of you, us. what is the word, mature? Because I'm not going to say age. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it comes with, I learn more from my students than I do that. Right, them. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I taught fifth and sixth grade math one year, and my, my degree is, you know, not for that, but I learned more about teaching when I had to teach something that I just did by nature. You know, I, I just, I, I had to break it down and, and uh, explain it like that. But the point is uh, that in the church, we sometimes uh, put up with, a teaching that's not so good. And I, I loved when Bob was able to teach, and I know he's, uh, I loved sitting in that Wednesday night class when he was teaching. Because he had studied well, and he, he was right on track, and I was taking notes like crazy. And some sometimes when I miss a class, I would, I would make sure I got the notes, I got them in my file. When I go back to teach the life of Christ, I'll be referring back to those notes on Mark because I was learning something. And I like to be in a class where I'm learning something or being reminded of something that I need to be reminded of instead of, well, let's say, it. I want this to be in everybody's class. It's not my class, it's your class. So let's all sit around and say something. Well, 
Okay. Uh, I would tell you what Ed said that a friend of his said about that. Well, you know, since Ed said it, we re rearrange our ignorance. Right. <laughs> uh, but we need to be really concerned about the educational program of the church. And I, I had a woman say to me one time, I don't know the Bible very well. I just need to teach about a second grade. And I thought, I don't want you teaching my second grade. No. Plus, you know, and I've said this in this class before, but that's okay. We sometimes repetition helps. But a child is going to believe everything you say in class. Now, you guys, if I say something wrong, you're going to ask me about it. And you're going to think about it. And we're going to sit down and look at it. And, I, and if I've said something that's out of harmony with this, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring it into harmony with this, and I'm going to, because that's what I've been doing all my life, is trying to make my life, and not that I'm any better than anybody else. I, that, I know that's what you've been doing, striving to bring your life under um, the teaching of this book. But we might ask, though, why was James so concerned about this? And let's just look at 1 Corinthians 14. Because we get a window into um, the uh, meetings of the early church. You know, uh, we have the, our meetings are so structured. You know, everybody comes in, we get quiet. Uh, then someone gets up to, to lead a song or a prayer. And, you know, we have everything in order and all. And that's good. Uh, in thought, fact, Paul is going to remind them that let everything be done decently and in order at the end of this in 1 Corinthians 14. But in verses 26 through 40, he says here, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, let all things be done for edification. This was, of course, spoken during the time of the miraculous gifts, and we have to remember that. If anyone speaks in, in a tongue, let that be two, or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. Because if I were up here speaking in Spanish, would you understand? We need, you would need an interpreter, wouldn't you? And at that time, there were people who had the gift to speak in a language they had not learned. And, oh boy, that sounds so good. That makes me look so different from everybody. But if you're not understanding, it doesn't make any difference at all. That's why Paul says, let everything be done to edification. And let's have someone interpret. And look at verse 28. But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and God. That is just mentally, you know. Uh, let two or three prophets speak. And the gift of prophecy was an inspired gift because they did not have, they had the Old Testament, but they did not have all this New Testament that we have revealed. And now that we have it revealed, that's what we lean on. But uh, there were some who had that gift, and he said, let them speak one by one. What if we were all in here talking, you know, and uh, Marsha was here uh, teaching from James chapter 2, and Ruby uh, wanted to teach from James chapter 3, and I wanted to teach from Galatians 5, and we're all doing this all at the same time. Who's going to learn anything, <laughs> you know? And he says, uh, uh, let them speak two or three, and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to one who says, by, let him first keep silence. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Just because at that time, because God had revealed something to you, you didn't have to jump up and give it right then. And again, remember that this is in the time when the miraculous gifts were uh, uh, were involved, but it has application today that we do things in an orderly fashion. In fact, uh, 
Verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And he goes on to talk about other uh, types of things, but I was reminded when I was reading that of a congregation we visited in a mission area outside the U.S., and I'm not going to go any further than to just say that because I don't want it, the people to be identified. But we were visiting there one Sunday morning, and it was a very small group. And in fact, uh, the missionary who was there uh, had told us that just not very many people came, that there was, you know, and he didn't know why. Well, that particular Sunday, there was a man visiting from the States also. And there were just Gary and me and this guy and the missionary in the adult class as they called it. His wife was teaching some of the children, and I, wait a minute, no, I think there were, there were a few other young adults, yeah, in the class, but we were all sitting. And anyway, instead of just teaching the class, this teacher, you know, this missionary, asked this guy that was visiting if he had something he'd like to share. Well, he started off, we were in Philippians, yeah, he started off with something that was not biblical from Philippians. And, and Gary was sitting there, and after a while, Gary kept trying to bring it back to the scripture, you know. And the missionary there was just, he wanted everybody to get a chance to talk. Well, wait a minute. If somebody is teaching something that's, or is saying something that is not totally true, it may be, there may be a germ of truth in it, but it needs to be put in context and all like this. Uh, you know, and, and after a while, Gary felt like, well, I'm not accomplishing anything. So, But we left and we thought, maybe that's why this church is not growing. That, that anybody who comes in can have the floor. And I don't know that that's the case, but... At any rate, uh, the other thing that made people in, uh, in Jane's time uh, really want to be teachers was that there seemed to be a great honor associated with teaching at that particular time. In uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 28, uh, Paul will say that God has set them in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, and then teachers. Oh, so they're up there real high, you know. And so I, I want to be up there where I had a person, and, and I never did like for people to really look at me. Mother was always saying when I was a little baby that, you know, how people would come up and say, oh, I want to see the baby. And every time I would scream like everything and cry and all like this. I never liked people just looking at me. But I had one person one time tell me that she thought I taught just to be up in front of everybody and have everybody look at me. <laughs> and you don't know, and plus, I thought, if you knew how much time I spent in this book to be able to do what I do, um, you know, you wouldn't say that. But see, that's how we are sometimes. We try to make little judgments about people. But at that time, there was so somebody that was an ego seeker, somebody that, that really liked to be out front. Yeah, I want to teach. And I told you all about that elder in West Texas that was always saying he was such a good teacher. You know? um, and then um, also, uh, and you, you may want to refer that to this in Romans chapter 2, 17 through 24, where uh, Paul talks to the Jews in particular, and he says, if you want to be teachers of the law, why don't you teach yourself? You know, live by what you're teaching. And then we studied about these, the false teachers that came into the church in Galatians. Paul warns about them. Uh, and then first and second Peter, Peter warns about them. And well, Peter warns about them in first Peter and then in second Peter he says, uh, they're here. And Jude says, they're here. So we have to be concerned about that. And that's one of the reasons that uh, 
uh, James talks about this, but how false teachers that were they just in the first century? There's some still today, and some still today will infiltrate church. Now I've got something here that says on the next page. Oh yeah. All right. Um, the main reason he says here, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. And I believe in the King James Version, it says that greater condemnation. I looked up that word just to see, and uh, it was that has uh, uh, the Strong's number, you know, that it gives numbers to all of the Greek words because I, I don't know Greek and I like that. But if there's a number on it and uh, I can look that up, in other, uh, all, almost all other word studies and, and Greek definitions are key to those numbers. I looked up that number, and one of the meanings is a decision for or against a crime. So he's talking about a criminal thing, not just a judgment of, uh -huh, but a judgment in regard to a criminal situation. And other words that are used in the King James that to translate that same Greek word are avenged, condemned, or condemnation, or damnation, as well as judgment. So those are strong words, aren't they? Very strong words. And Thayer defines it, uh, again, as condemnation of wrong, or the decision that's passed down regarding wrong, condemning wrong. And Jesus used that word in Mark chapter 12 and verse 40 when he talked about the uh, Pharisees and, and uh, uh, who were uh, considered themselves teachers of the law and so on, that he said they devour widows' houses and for a pretense they make long prayers they will receive greater condemnation. See, uh, so there's that uh, notice. Now, let's get down to uh, the jewels. So let's talk about those and, uh, a bit uh, that he has listed here on page 70 and 71. Um, he says here, Though uh, in the second paragraph on page 79, I said 70 and 71, it's 79 and 80. Duh, I can't even read. And those were numbers. Oh. Okay. It says, here we are warned that not many should become teachers. He adds that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. That's the way it's uh, translated in uh, the ESV. I still prefer the condemnation because that speaks that that puts me on alert okay the reason for this stern warning could be because teachers use their tongue to instruct others I marked out could be and I put is page 79 are you looking for it uh, Marsha I saw you turning <laughs> yeah but he says, the reason for this stern warning could be because teachers use their tongue to instruct others. I think it is because they use it. To give a stern warning is justified because the destiny of men's souls are at stake. Standing before others to declare, thus saith the Lord, is an awesome and serious responsibility. I would hate to know that I had said something in class that caused another person to be lost. I would hate to know that. And sometimes that can happen if we're not careful, especially those of us who are teachers or those of us who are in more leadership situations in the church because people look up to, like elders' wives, uh, deacons' wives, preachers' wives. And today, 
I think we need a warning too about the use of text messages. Uh, now, Lori texts me, and I know she's being funny three fourths of the time. <laughs> she she texts me this morning about the markers. <laughs> and it's a good thing because <laughs> I'm forgetful. Y'all know that. But sometimes in a worded message, an email or a text, it kind of depends on the person receiving it too, is how that's going to come across. And so we need to be careful in regard to that. And I know several years ago, uh, something happened uh, to us in the church that was real hurtful and everything. And Gary just mentioned to an older preacher, he said, I think I'm just going to write a letter to everybody concerned and tell them what happened. And this preacher said, no. A letter tends to take on a personality all its own because the letter tends to be put out there in, what would I say? It again, depends on the person reading it. And I've had, I've had this happen to me. I wrote a letter about uh, something that I just thought I was being real nice. I, I wrote a, a letter about uh, to a publisher. And, and said, please don't publish this manuscript at this time. It, it was in a lectureship book. I didn't want it published at that time. And I own, but I, I didn't know at the time, but I, uh, when I'm writing, I own that material. So it was within my right to do that. Well, he called me and told me how horrible I was about not wanting it in there. And I thought, that's my manuscript. I just didn't want it published. And I thought I said it as nice as I could. Yeah, Lord. You didn't think you were being nice. You need to take that out of the context of our book and say, well, we're nice, we're nice. Yeah. And it's the audience reception receptors yeah. mm -hmm. that may be mm -hmm. skewed mm -hmm. from whatever else is going on in their life. Yeah, so yeah. Nice. And that that's why the writing of something uh, in a text or in an email, when it's when it could be read in a negative way or in a hurtful way. And we also need to be aware of our tones. I, I was going to bring this whole little poem and I forgot to, I forgot it because Lori didn't know I was going to do it to text me for the me. But I remember most of it. It's, and I, I think I, I had this back several, two or three years ago. It's not so much what you say, but the manner in which you say it. Mm -hmm. It's not so much the language you use, but the tones in which you convey it. Come here, I sharply said, and the baby cowered and wept. Come here, I cooed, and he looked and smiled, and straight to my lap he crept. The words come but from the mind, and grow by study and art. But the tones leak out from the inner self and reveal the state of the heart. And our tongues can sometimes. And I have to watch that. <laughs> I learned this about Gary's dad. Gary's dad liked me. He really did. <laughs> but uh, uh, when uh, when he would call us, you know, and it was long distance, so he, you know, when he would call, if I answered the phone, I would say, hello. And he would say, hello yourself. And I would, at first, I'm, I was like, I'm sorry, I answered the phone. <laughs> But, but I got, you know, when I, when I understood that that was just his way and his tone coming across the phone wire, you know, so, you know, we have to learn some things about uh, our brothers and sisters, too. Um, and and that, that helps when we interact and when we get to know one another better. But let's look at some of these jewels right quickly. Oh, my goodness, time keeps going by. Um, First jewel, teachers need proper knowledge. We've already really talked about that, but we do need proper knowledge. We need to study, and we need to grow. And one of the reasons that I've written those three books is for young, new Christian teachers, that teachers of children, so that, so that they can get the overall view before they start teaching those individual uh, 
Bible stories because I've had the blessing of being able to study more. And I've had the blessing of, uh, of having a, a grandfather that, uh, that saw some beautiful things in scripture that uh, sometimes uh, others haven't necessarily uh, spent the time seeing. And, and so I, I want to help teachers have proper knowledge. But good teachers need to study and study many times some word meanings, but not every single word. I sat in a retreat where this girl went through almost every word in the text other than A and Z uh, and, and gave the Greek meaning of it. Well, that makes people think you have to know Greek to, to study the Bible. It also makes them think that maybe this is not worth anything. The providence of God takes care of a lot of things when men who are honest and knowledgeable sit down to translate his word. Uh, and at any rate, um, I wanted to um, just mention that to her, but I didn't. But there are a lot of things, you know, uh, you don't have to invest in a big library, and I'm gonna put some things on the board in just a minute that are absolutely free that uh, you can go to. The second jewel, it's that teachers' words will judge them. In fact, all, all of us, our words will judge us, won't they? Jesus talks about uh, that in uh, Matthew chapter 12, and let's just read that as he has it here in the interest of time. Uh, either make the tree good and the fruit good, or make the tree bad, and the fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Now, they had been saying to Jesus, the uh, leaders of the Jews had been saying to Jesus that he was of, of the devil, that he was of the devil. And that's why he says this, will make the tree good and the fruit good, or the tree bad and the, and the fruit bad. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. <coughs> out of the abundance of the heart, what the, the mouth speaks. The good person out of good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Careless words, especially out of the mouth of a teacher. Careless words out of any of us can cause problems, but careless words, and that's not just in the classroom, that's when we're outside of class. We need to be aware. Uh, and he also makes the note, uh, George Carmen also makes the note here, that it's difficult to speak the right words effectively if you're not practicing what you preach. I remember back in uh, southern Louisiana, there was a young woman that, well, she didn't think she was a, an alcoholic, but she had to have a glass of wine uh, before her kids got up. Uh, when she sent them off to school and her husband off to work, she had to have a glass of wine to relax. Later in the afternoon, she needed a glass of wine before her kids came home from school, and then another one before her husband came home. I think that's every day, that's all. But the, the elders didn't know that uh, about her. A few of us learned that later, you know, as we associated with her, we learned that later. But uh, the main thing is she was only in church on Sunday morning and not for class most of the time. Well, the elders decided that, oh, they could get her to come to class by giving her a class to teach. Well, they did, and it, Tanya was in the class. Well, after a few weeks, you know, an adult is not uh, really important to a child until they're like teaching or something, and then they, they, oh, that's who that is, you know. And so Tanya was noticing that Mary wasn't there on Sunday nights, and Mary wasn't there on Wednesday nights. And so Tanya asked, you know, she's what seven, I think. She said. Mommy, are we supposed to be at church all the time? 
And I said, well, Tanya, when the elders, you know, have decided that these are, you know, good times for us to meet, uh, and we study and we worship and, and all, but that, yes, we should be there uh, so that we can grow and learn, you know, all those good things that mommies say to little seven-year-olds. And she said, well, Miss Mary doesn't come. Mm -hmm. See, even a little child will notice those things. Even a little child will notice those. And so we have to be aware. And then teachers, the third one, uh, teachers must use gracious words. I wonder how many people have been turned away from obeying the gospel because of the attitude displayed by a person presenting the truth. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15, he doesn't have that in here, but we have noted that before. To sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to one who asks you with meekness and reverence or meekness and fear. And then Colossians 4, 6 that he does mention, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. I have to end with this example. In my hometown, back in the, when I was a little kid and young, much younger, there, there was a, a family there, their last name was Wheeler, and they were the pillars of the church. They were pretty well off, so they gave well. And if a, a person came to dear old little Wyndham, Texas, uh, some of you, Gene, did y'all go through there when you came to Honey Grove to my parents? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> if you went on Highway 56, now if you went out on 82, you just bypassed it. But, uh, but if anybody came there and asked, uh, uh, where is the member of the Church of Christ? They, they wouldn't have pointed out uh, uh, my mother or, or uh, somebody else, you know. Uh, they wouldn't have pointed out Wiley Grissom and his family or whatever. Uh, they would have pointed out the Wheelers. Yes, they are. And they were good people. They were good people. But... One time, one of the Wheeler men, his name was D, married a woman who was not a Christian. And, of course, they wanted to teach her. And, but I had been around them. At, later on, I had been around some of them enough to, to know a little bit more about them. It was kind of like they liked the kind of preaching that was, if not, why not? You know, ooh, ooh, ooh. That's, well... You know, you can say the truth without just banging somebody over the head with it. And at any rate, uh, his wife never was baptized. Later, after he died, after Dee died, she was baptized. And my mother heard about it, and she went to uh, his family. She said, I was so excited to learn that she had been baptized. Here was their response. Don't see why she couldn't have done it while he was alive. Well, a little later at somebody's funeral, my mother saw her. And she put her arm around her and she said, I was so happy to hear that you were baptized. And she said, well, I probably should have done it while Dee was still alive. But you know how harsh the wheelers are. <laughs> now that, and when Mother told me that, I was like, oh, please, I never want, let me speak the truth always in love. Let me speak it with gracious words. And I haven't always done that. I'll be, totally honest with you. I haven't always done that. But after Mother told me that, I was like, I, I just made a, another commitment to that. Because you see, my mind works like, I, I guess it's because I'm a mathematician, but my mind, I, 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 I could be a good debater. I can be 
faded into the bank pretty quickly and easily. I could be when I was younger, and I have been. When I realized that, and it took a, a situation in the lady's <coughs> life, and I realized what I had done, I went home and I said, never, ever, 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 ever again. I had to watch myself. I had to really work on that. Because that's not a good thing. People don't learn in a situation like that. People don't learn. All they learned was that Sarah could really put somebody in the place. Yeah, I could. But that's not a good thing. And we have to learn. Are you meeting it in the sons of thunder? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The words of graciousness and purpose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because that's a mm -hmm. big jump. Yeah, yeah, it was a. But having your personality, your passion, your stubbornness, whatever it is, under his control. That's, that's the thing. And some of us have to work harder at that than others. Gary is a nice little guy. He's a pleaser. He always was. His mother, I mean, his aunt saw him, and, and she had a little boy about his age. Gary would just sit on the floor and play and not get into anything. He was just good, and her little boy was going around getting into everything. She said, I was so glad when Don was born because Don was a real kid. He was getting into stuff, you know. But Gary, but he's just always been kind of a little classic. Now, don't get the idea that he's not the head of the house because he says no to me pretty sternly sometimes. No. And, uh, and he also uh, uh, tells me, you know, no, you shouldn't say that. And that's not a good thing to do. You know, we can't buy that. We're not going to do that. <laughs> you know, uh, and he, he's, uh, but, but he is, he, that's his personality, though, I hear. And so he didn't have as hard a time on that part. He had a little bit harder time on some other things, and I'm not going to tell you what those are because that's for him to say. Uh, we're not talking about him, we're talking about me. Uh, <laughs> but we all have to learn some of those things, and I just had to learn a little bit more than some other people. Uh, but uh, teachers need to be prepared, need to have gracious words, need to pray earnestly that you never, ever, ever say any truth in such a way that it would cause somebody to either leave the Lord or not become a Christian. And that's hard sometimes. It is hard. But we can all do it. And Jane's got a song for us. Yeah. This is the best lesson ever. You're truly an educator. This is oh. the best lesson. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Uh, and I, while Jean is. While you're putting the, uh, while you're leaving the song, is it okay if I put these things on the floor? Okay. I can sing in my heart while I'm doing this. I wanted to give you some free stuff that you can uh, get to if you have a computer. And these are all very good. Number seven, eight, three. 783. Would you not tell it today?
to do is just real quickly with you. This is free. You can just key it into your uh, address bar. The good thing about this is he has a search engine there, and if there's a topic you're concerned about or something, uh, you can key in that topic, and if he's written an article on it, it'll come up. And at the end of the article, usually some other related articles come up. And uh, several of you know uh, Wayne Jackson. He just uh, passed away a few months ago. Uh, and he's a really good biblical scholar. Uh, he has two or three opinions that I'm not so sure I agree with, but opinions are okay to agree or disagree on. It's the, the word that's important here. Radically Christian is another freebie and uh, you can subscribe to it. This one you can just go to off and on when you want to. This one you can subscribe to it and Wes McAdams who used to be in Abilene, now he's at Plano, um, puts out a, uh, all about every two weeks I think, he puts out an article on something uh, and uh, sometimes he'll have a little podcast on, on a topic or or something a lot of these relate to Christian living and uh, things like that then uh, Focus Press also puts out a, uh, a bi-weekly little email article uh, I get that uh, off and on a lot of times talking about some of the social issues that we face uh, kind of how to negotiate and get back together after the pandemic is over and then some things on evidences and all like this. This is a good one. These two, Come Fill Your Cup, this is put together by a, a young woman in uh, Preacher's Life in uh, Dublin, I think, is where she is. But um, several, especially younger Christian women, write articles on this. Uh, but this old Christian woman has written a, an article for it. Um, but it's free. And there's also underneath this, uh, I think you can get to Kathy Pollard's uh, book, mark, Bible marking topics uh, under Come Fill Your Cup. And the Wellspring is a kind of a devotional, a women's devotional uh, you know, uh, website uh, that Teresa Hampton and uh, I need to check up on her. She's a dear sweet preacher's wife in Jackson, Mississippi, and she has MS, and then she had something, something else happen. She was in the hospital, and I saw that late last week on somebody's Facebook, and I haven't gotten back in touch to see how she's doing. Mm -hmm. But she is a dear sweet lady. SIBI, that's Sunset Bible Institute, or International Bible Institute, they have their old courses from back in Sunset's heyday. Their old courses with uh, people like Ed Horton, uh, Richard Rogers, uh, uh, Gerald Payton. Uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think a lot of the. Oh, yeah! Uh, Dayton Cassidy. Dayton Cassidy. But they have some of his courses and also just some lessons. Uh, you know, just some individual lessons, but those are in video form or audio form, and those are free, guys. Just free.